Greetings scholars. Um, what I want to talk to you about now is uh, the four, probably the four times that the people we call the founders um, met together prior to the American Revolution. Okay, These four meetings are important because prior to this these guys saw themselves as individual colonies. They, um, up to this point, they had rarely had common cause with anything. Um, but what we're going to find is at the beginning of this series of four meetings is these guys find they have more in common with each other than they have with the people in England. Um, and so this is sort of a part of what brings most of the revolution about. Okay, um, the time period is, is 20 years, roughly, between 1754 and 1775, when these guys start meeting together. Again, the first time they barely know each other, um, but then they keep coming back, crisis after crisis after crisis. They keep coming back together and having this meeting, um, and that's what changes everything. Um, Again, as we said before, we've already talked about this first one. It was called the Albany Congress. Okay, um, It was supposed to be for intercolonial defense. The idea was that as colonists, they need to have an army to protect themselves from the French and the Indians. Okay, um, When Washington's little skirmish went sour with the French, uh, it started a whole conflict and so these guys were trying to find a way to uh, to protect themselves, okay? And so this Albany Congress is going to be the first time, again, that they meet together. Now, um, it happens June uh, 1754, uh, just prior to the French arriving um, at Fort Necessity. 24 delegates show up from seven of the colonies. Probably the seven northernmost colonies, because they're um, they have closest contact with the French, and that's the crisis. That's the situation that brings you, that forces these guys into each other's um, uh, hemispheres. Okay, um, people like Benjamin Franklin, who comes from Pennsylvania, Thomas Hutchinson, who comes from Massachusetts. Now, these guys are here for different purposes. Franklin is here to protect the Pennsylvania merchants from the French soldiers who try to stop them from trading with the Indians. Hutchinson, even though he is interested in colonial defense, Hutchinson is also looking for some way to help stem the tide of smuggling and, uh, and sort of having a, an active sort of a police force uh, at his disposal as Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. So even though they've got different purposes in mind for what this thing's going to do, um, they all come together in agreement that they need to put together a small army. And all the colonies need to support it. They call this thing the Albany Plan of Union. Okay, Again, different purposes are going to be the thing that's going to derail this conference. The plan is a limited agency to coordinate defense for colonial affairs. Okay, they're going to put together an army. The crown will appoint a president, someone to preside over this congress um, and to be in charge of this little army. They will meet annually, uh, 48 representatives, people coming from each of the colonies, and they will discuss issues like making war, making peace, and then trade. Thomas Hutchinson and a few of the Tories like him want to add trade issues to these guys' responsibilities. That way, they're able to stem the tide of uh, smuggling and things like that. Um, it also gives this agency the power to tax the colonies directly. Now, this is the second red flag. The first thing, the colonists don't want them uh, messing with their um, with their trade. They don't want them messing with their sort of underground black market kind of a trade that's going on, but they also don't want an agency having the ability to tax them that they don't have the power to veto that tax. 
that they don't have the right to vote for the uh, representatives. It's sort of a taxation without representation issue. So they put together this plan of union, how they're going to put together the army, and all these things. When they go back to their respective colonies, the colonial assemblies reject it out of hand. They completely reject the idea of, of this thing because of those two reasons. Because of, number one, this idea that it's going to be used to regulate trade, and number two, it's going to have um, the power of taxation. Okay, so all of the colonial assemblies reject this idea. So the Albany Plan of Union really fails to accomplish anything except it introduces these people to each other. They come together with common cause for the first time here. This is the place. Everything changes in colonial America after the French and Indian War. And Everything from this point forward is leading us directly to the American Revolution. Now, we also try to get the natives, uh, friendly natives involved. Uh, the Iroquois League, for example, we send them 30 wagons, loads full of gifts and everything. And they make ambiguous promises. Oh, the Iroquois, we want peace in the region, etc., etc. But basically, the Iroquois prefer to play the French and the British off of each other uh, to their advantage. So um, they'll make ambiguous promises to the British that will help you with the French if the need arises, um, but nothing concrete. Again, the Albany Congress was a bust, a complete failure. The only thing it does is provide us with introductions. And I guess that's its only redeeming quality is the fact that it provided us these guys with the introductions to each other. Okay, the second the second time these guys come together is in the Stamp Act Congress. Um, the Stamp Act uh, is passed by the um, the Parliament in 1765. Okay, and. Uh, and the colonists are going to be up in arms about this uh, this new tax. It's at the end of the um, the French and Indian War. Uh, the war cost a fortune. Um, England was almost bankrupt. So England decides the Americans are going to pay for this war. And they're going to pay for it through taxation. And so what's going to happen is they're going to get, they're going to start imposing these taxes upon the colonists. I had to read the Declaration of Independence well before we got into this whole section because I want you to understand the grievances that they had and now I want you to see these grievances as they come on the scenes. Okay? Now, the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is a, is a tax placed on paper. Every kind of paper item. Um, uh, official papers, newspapers, pamphlets, contracts, court documents, licenses, deeds, wills, ships, uh, bill, uh, bills of lading, uh, apprentice master's contracts, indentured servants contracts. Any official document, any commercial document, any legal document would have a one pence tax placed on it. That way it could, um, it could be gathered collected so that they could pay off this war debt. Okay? The people who read newspapers and buy almanacs uh, every year are the ones who are going to wind up paying the most. Uh, the lawyers and the businesses are going to wind up paying a lot of money in this tax, and they didn't like it. They believe it disproportionately taxed business and the legal communities, because apparently these, um, these early uh, British colonists like to sue each other over and over and over again. And so they're constantly creating uh, new legal documents. Uh, now, they said it was unfair. They said it was unjustified. And so the problem is, um, uh, it's as far as they're concerned, it's a tax without representation. Because after all, they don't vote for Parliament. Okay, they don't vote for Parliament. Now, here's the big thing. England has been using a stamp tax in England 
for more than a decade by that time. This is not something new that was being imposed on the colonists alone. This is something that had been imposed on all English subjects, but for this time, the colonists had been exempt from it. The colonists had merely never had to pay it. So actually they were getting kind of getting over it. England said it's about time for them to join the British Empire, and so they started uh, requiring them to pay the tax also. Okay? It's designed, as far as England's concerned, to tax the people who could afford to pay it. Right? The legal community, the business community. These are the people who could afford to pay the tax. Okay? Grenville, Lord Grenville, who uh, came up with all these uh, new taxes, also required that it be paid in silver. Okay? Not, not, uh, not script or uh, being paid in barter. It had to be paid in silver. They had to uh, put monies into the treasury to help pay off the war debt. Now, Grenville is also going to hire the tax collectors from the colonists. He is going to find colonists who are willing to serve as tax collectors, and they are going to be paid 8% of all of the revenues that they collect. So if you're a diligent tax collector who's eager to collect those taxes, you get paid more. Um, this is not a good plan, especially around Boston. Um, as Lord Grenville is going to find out. The biggest problem for the colonists, this is their primary argument, it's clearly a revenue collecting tax and not a tax designed to regulate trade. Okay, The colonists believe that attempts to regulate trade were legal, not desirable, but they were legal, a legitimate function of government. However, revenue collecting taxes um, is a function of the people's gift to the government. <coughs> Therefore, requiring the people's consent. For Lord Grenville to impose this tax upon them is a tax without representation. Now, immediately and this is where Thomas Hutchinson gets a bad rap. Immediately, Thomas Hutchinson fires off a letter to Lord Grenville and tells him they are not going to appreciate this. He explains to Grenville the distinction that the colonists see between revenue collection and trade regulation. And um, he explains how the, the people in the colonies are going to see this as taxation without representation which violates their rights as British subjects. Most people have to come to grips with that. They have to come to understand that. It's their rights as British subjects that are being violated, not their rights as, uh, as Americans. The colonists already pay taxes to serve, to serve their governments, their local colonial governments. Those are the governments that they vote for. Now, Taxes, according to Magna Carta, all the way back to 1215, taxes are a gift to the king from the people. Okay, The king cannot require your property without your consent. That's one of the things that the Magna Carta says. Representative, grant the tax money to the king for the people as their representatives. Grenville tells Hutchinson that the colonists are represented. And you'll read about this distinction in your text between the notion of actual representation and virtual representation. We have a problem um, today. Our term for virtual means not really. Okay, uh, So you talk about virtual reality, we're talking about something that's not really reality. But what Grenville's notion of virtual representation is, it's uh, the sentence would, would be like this. By virtue of being an English subject, the parliament represents you. By virtue of being an English subject, the parliament represents you. 
So Grenville believes they are represented by the Parliament, even though they had no voice in appointing the people to the Parliament. Um, this doesn't go over well, again, with the colonists. Daniel Delaney writes pamphlets against it. Uh, his conclusion is a tax levied by a distant government is without representation by definition. A tax levied by a distant government is without representation by definition. And so Daniel Delaney's uh, pamphlet will be circulated throughout the colonies. Um, it attempts to debunk virtual representation and, um, and it starts this whole thing. Now, news that arrived in April 1765 uh, it's supposed to take effect November 1st, 1765, seven months later. The governors are royal appointees. They're not going to help the colonists. Eight of the colonial assemblies hold discussions about what are we going to do about this Stamp Act. Okay? The Virginia House of Burgesses um, is the one, the most famous, and everybody talks about it all the time. They hold the discussion that creates something called the Virginia Resolves. The Virginia Resolves. Uh, Patrick Henry uh, comes to the assembly with a handful of resolutions to debate. Uh, we'll discuss those quickly and then we'll move forward. Okay? The Virginia Resolves. They are radical opposition to the Stamp Act. His first, um, his first point uh, is that Virginians are all British subjects. I know I wrote citizens there. Um, scratch that out and put subjects, okay? Um, being vir from Virginia means you are a British subject. They recognize that they are British subjects. Point two, as British subjects, we have the same rights as the other people in Britain. Okay, that's the second point. The third point, one of the rights that all Britons share is the right to self-taxation. As I said, it was a violation of their rights as British subjects, not their rights as Americans. And Virginia had always taxed themselves through the House of Burgesses, their elected legislative body. Okay? Now, the radical leap in these Virginia Resolves comes here. And it really logically follows based on what had been said before. Only the House of Burgesses has the right to tax Virginians. Okay? Well, if Virginians are British subjects, British subjects have the right to self-taxation, um, then the people in Virginia who vote for the House of Burgesses, the House of Burgesses is the only one who has the right to tax them. Uh, some people start to back off of these points at this point. Then, no valid, no tax uh, outside of this is therefore valid. And then the last one for good measure, anyone who disagrees is an enemy of Virginia. Anyone who disagrees is an enemy of Virginia. Now, um, Henry, after they debate and discuss these, and all seven of these uh, pass, Henry runs out to... Um, the newspaper editor who's holding the front page. After he leaves, the delegates in the House of Burgesses start to discuss the last two, right? The, the notion that uh, only the House of Burgesses, that no outside tax is valid, and that anyone who um, disagrees is an enemy of Virginia. They start rediscussing those because they're not sure if they want to take such a stance. However, when the newspaper comes out in the morning, all seven of the Virginia Resolves are published as the stance of Virginia. Now, <coughs> what's going to happen? Well, that's the official stance in uh, Virginia. Massachusetts is going to have a group of people called the Sons of Liberty. Um, they are going to start the popular resistance, the protests and the riots. Um, they are going to, the Sons of Liberty are going to start to terrorize the tax collectors in an attempt to keep the tax from being collected. Okay? 
Uh, you should have read about Andrew Oliver in your text. Um, but this is what's going to happen. Large street demonstrations and mock executions are going to take place all over the colonies. Now, um, the thing is, when these street demonstrations start, one thing that, that happens is that uh, they start attacking, um, they, they actually burn Thomas Hutchinson's house to the ground, looking for um, evidence that he was complicit, that he had conspired with the King of England to impose this tax upon them. Okay? Um, it gets bad here in, uh, in 1765. It gets really bad in Boston uh, with the riots and everything. And eventually, these uh, people will be replaced. And finally, the, a prime minister named uh, Lord North will be appointed by King George um, to, uh, to try to smooth things over. Lord North is a businessman. Lord North wants peace with the colonies. And so he's going to assist the colonies to, uh, to do as much as he can to uh, pacify them. So the business and trade can start back up again. Okay. Um, which leads us to the third uh, moment for the, um, the third time these founders meet together. It's normally what's called the uh, First Continental Congress. It meets together in 1773. Um, it meets together as a result of the uh, Tea Act basically as a result of the uh, Boston Tea Party when the Sons of Liberty in Boston dump uh, 90,000 pounds worth of tea into the harbor okay um, in 1773 ships arrive in Boston Harbor uh, they unload everything except for the tea uh, the captain can't leave however if he leaves he has to pay the tax out of his own pocket um, and if he stays then he gets fined because his cargo is late. So late that night, 100 to 150 Indians, see that in quotes, uh, boarded the three ships, and with about 2,000 people watching from the docks, they unload the three ships into the harbor. Most people have this picture of the Boston Tea Party as um, a bunch of guys running around on the back of a boat dumping tea bags into the water. But it was 342 massive sea chests full of tea from India, uh, weighing over 90,000 pounds. They had to use cranes to uh, pull the tea out of the hold and uh, dump it into the harbor. Okay, 90,000 pounds. If the Sons of Liberty in Boston were trying to get England's attention, they now have England's attention. Okay? The cost of this was over 10,000 pounds sterling. Enormous amount of money. The problem is, the East India Tea Company was given this special privilege to sell this tea to the colonists without tax because it was ready to go bankrupt. And for these guys, to dump 90,000 pounds of tea costing 10,000 pounds sterling into the ocean, a company on the verge of bankruptcy is going to collapse. England can't allow this to go unanswered. It came to a point where up to this point the things that the colonists were doing were annoying. Up to this point, they were agitating, and they were being annoying, and they were smuggling, and, and it bothered England, but now they run the risk of damaging the entire English economy. Now England has paid attention to them, and they institute what are called the Coercive Acts. These Coercive Acts close this Boston port, uh, to all trade, in and out. The Massachusetts Government Act makes the governor all-powerful. Um, it will appoint a council to help the governor rule the colony. 
and it forbids town meetings of any kind in the Massachusetts colony. Um, it also passes the Impartial Administration of Justice Act, which, if a British soldier is accused of a crime, they will not be tried in the colonies. They will be sent back to England for trial. <coughs> and also the Quartering Act, where um, it used to be that if you had a barn and soldiers were in your area, you would be required to allow the soldiers to sleep in your barn. However, the Quartering Act is amended to require uh, the people in Boston to allow soldiers to live in their homes. And if you resist the Quartering Act, then you would be arrested, you along with your whole family, and the soldiers would move into your house anyway. Okay. Um, General Gage, commander of the Royal Army, is appointed as the governor, and Thomas Hutchinson is relieved of his responsibilities as the royal governor. And he goes home. Well, he doesn't go home because the Sons of Liberty have burned his house down. Thomas Hutchinson, a seventh generation colonist, actually goes to England. He actually goes to England. Uh, his family had been here for over seven generations. He's a descendant of Anne Hutchinson. Um, he basically says there's nothing here. And he, he goes, he moves to England. Uh, there's also another act called the Quebec Act. It was basically designed to rub salt in the wounds. It gave the, uh, it gave the colonists um, in uh, the French Quarter in Canada more rights and it took the rights away from the people in Boston. Now, um, the Continental Congress meets together, okay, um, at this point, and uh, they come up with a document. They pass the question, what are the rights we have? What are the liberties we have as British subjects? What powers do Parliament hold over us legitimately and they write it up in a Declaration of Rights and they start staggering boycotts um, against British goods and they sent this thing off to England to wait for a reply. Um, they want things to go back the way it was before um, 1765. They finish their work October 26, 1774. They send it off to England um, they're supposed to reconvene the next May, but they don't get a chance. They don't get a chance. What happens is um, Lexington and Concord. Lexington and Concord. And so what we're going to do now, uh, this is almost our uh, 30 minutes. Uh, how much time is left? Does it say? Oh, you're on 28, oh, 28 minutes. Okay, well, let's see if I can do it. Um, Lexington and Concord had happened uh, in, uh, just before, in April. Um, now, when these guys meet together, they've got two purposes. They have to raise and support an army, and they have to attempt to negotiate a reconciliation. Okay? Um, there's no real authority for this Congress. Okay? Um, these guys have been fired upon. But by the end of 1775, there's no longer any royal authorities in the colonies. Okay? These guys all have to learn to trust each other. Let's see here. All of the colonies send delegations except for Georgia. Most are not ready to break with England yet. Okay? The middle colonies completely oppose a break. The English provides us protection from France and Spain. Massachusetts believed they were already broken because they opened fire on the people of Massachusetts. But they all agreed we need to build an army. We need to build an army. And that's going to be one of the things they accomplish. Ten rifle companies will be put together, about 1,600 men, from Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. For commander, we'll get George Washington. Uh, he showed up with his uniform. I guess he was applying for the job. Uh, John Dickinson and Thomas Jefferson write a document called the Declaration of the Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms, which is effectively a declaration of war. 
Okay? It says in 